us, <laughs> and it's, it's wonderful to be here together. We are going to have a very blessed morning. We are going to first, we are going to start um, with praising God, because it's wonderful to be together. It's wonderful to be in the presence of God. We are always in His presence. He would never leaves us nor forsake us. But when we are together, we are in a very special way with Him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And let us ask Jesus to uh, start the service for us by singing a song for us. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Thank you.
Thank you very much, and Matt will lead us in prayer. Amen. Thank you very much, Matt. And we will continue, and Jesus will lead us in another song, Win Peace Like a River. Well, 
Thank you very much. This is amazing. It's an amazing song. And I hope that all of us can say, yes, it is well with my soul. Because today we are going to look at our soul. And that is what the sermon is going to be about. Because we need to make sure that it is really well with our soul. Now, we're not going to take an offering. If you want to give an offering, you can give it afterwards. The offering plate is there. You can just put it in there. I just want to remind you, because of COVID, we need to have a one-way system. So immediately after the service, if you, can, you go through that door, and then you go out. So you, you will exactly see, because we're not allowed to... Uh, we need to have a one-way system. So let us look at Mark 8, verse 35 to 36. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? This is quite a sobering question, isn't it? It's quite a sobering question. What does it mean to have gained the whole world? That's immense, isn't it? Ask Muhammad Ali. Can you remember Muhammad Ali? Yes, ask Muhammad Ali, the three-time world heavyweight boxing champion. When he was floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee, he was king of his profession, isn't it? The thriller in Manila. Can you remember that? Yes? But that was yesterday. <laughs> that was yesterday. And yes, my friend, the pole of power is greasy. The Roman Emperor Charlemagne knew that. Legend has it that he asked to be entombed, sitting upright on his throne. And he asked that his throne be placed on his head with his scepter in his hand. And he requested that the royal cape be draped around his shoulders and an open book be placed in his lap. That was A.D. 814. And nearly 200 years later, Emperor Othello wanted to see if the burial request had been carried out. So he then sent a team of men to open the tomb and to make a report. And they found the body just as Charlemagne had requested. Exactly. Only now, nearly two centuries later, the scene was gruesome. The crown was tilted, the mantle moth-eaten, the body disfigured, but open. On the skeletal thighs was the book that Charlemagne had requested, the Bible. And one bony finger pointed to Matthew 16, verse 28, and we see it in Mark 8, verse 35 as well. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul. 
You can answer that one. And that is what a sermon is about to today. Now, apparently, the world has a net worth of $360 trillion. That is the worth, net worth of the world today. $360 trillion. And according to a maths expert, if you had it in that amount of money in dollar bills and stacked it up, that stack would reach over two-thirds of the distance to the moon. Almost there, but not quite. But my friend, if all of that was yours, all that money, $360 trillion, what have you gained? What have you gained? Jesus said, you've gained something that won't satisfy. So just look, for instance, at the richest person on earth today. Who is who? Jeff? Yeah, yeah? Yes, that's right. Thank you very much. Jeff Bezos, what is his net worth? His net worth is $116.9 billion. That is his net worth. And Jeff is the founder of Jisoo Amazon, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> but Jeff never disclosed his religious beliefs at all. To all appearances, Unless Jeff makes changes, Jeff is forfeiting his soul. To all appearances, we can't see in a person's heart, but to all appearances, unless Jeff makes changes, Jeff is forfeiting his soul. I need to ask you, is all his money worth it? And when he dies and appears before the throne of God, will his 116 billion count for anything? You know the old story of how to boil a frog? Can you remember that one? You drop the frog in the boiling water and he'll jump out before he's injured because he doesn't like you there. So what do you do? You put him in a pot of cold water, and he's perfectly comfortable, very happy. Then you put him on the stove, and little by little, the water gets warm. And it's very pleasant for the frog at first, very nice. Then it goes to jacuzzi level. And he begins, the little froggy begins to be a little panicky and a little bit anxious. And finally, when it's boiling, it's too late. It's too late. And we Christians are like that, aren't we? We are exactly like that. We get into the world, and it's so nice. It's so nice. And then it gets a little bit warmer, and it's even more enjoyable. And one day, it becomes too late. We have gained the world, but we have lost or forfeited our souls. Let me ask you something. If you owned the most beautiful house in Victoria Road, a stone's throw away from Kensington Palace, with an average price of just over eight million, because that's what the houses there cost, average price, filled with stunning tapestries and paintings and carpets and furniture, beautiful stuff, and in that house, 
is your 10-month-old baby. <laughs> and whilst you are working in one of the luxurious offices in the middle of London, you get a telephone call and people say that your place is on fire. Are you going to worry more about your beautiful furniture and tapestries or more about your 10-month-old baby? What's it going to be? You see, my friend, if there is a human being in your skin and you have a soul, you are going to think about your baby, isn't it? Not about the tapestries and the furniture. You're going to think about your baby. That's the same with God. That's exactly the same with God. With all of the bulk and the greatness and the glory of God's whole universe, all the planets and everything, it is you that God, that is precious in God's sight. Amen? You are precious in His sight. And that is how God feels about you and your soul. Your soul is important to God. And in our Bible reading, we see that it's the words of Jesus and we see that there are basically two treasures. One is on the earth, and the other one is spiritual. Two treasures. And it's a choice that you need to make. You can't have it both. It's one or the other. And your choice determines where you will spend your effort and your energy and your money. That choice determines. And the, the treasure on earth involves wealth and power. And it's a priceless treasure. It's amazing. And it's something to go for, isn't it? Lots of wealth, lots of power. And yes, money and clothes and houses and land and cars and jewelry and gadgets, they're all exciting, but ultimately, they're worthless. Jesus says that the other treasure is more valuable and much more durable. So the question is, which of these two treasures do you choose? In order to make an informed decision, let us just have a quick glance on what the soul really is. What is your soul? Your soul is the identity that makes you who you really are. That is your soul. It is the seat of your memory and your feelings it is your imagination, it is your convictions, your desires, and your affections. In a nutshell, that is your soul. Your soul is so valuable that God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to the cross to suffer and to die so that your soul may be saved. That is how valuable your soul is. And the Bible says that there is a heaven and there is a hell. And you choose where you spend eternity. And many of you are choosing right now. So what are you doing with your soul? Are you gambling with your soul? Taking a chance with it, or are you treasuring your soul? What are you doing with your soul? Because you see, every soul is priceless. Every soul is priceless. Every soul is worth more than this world 
and its contents. And I've already told you what is the net worth of the world. But every soul is, is, is worth more than this whole world and its contents. And the soul of our queen is the same price as the soul of the beggar on the streets of London. Does that make sense? The soul of the queen is not more expensive than the soul of the beggar. The price is equal. The soul is capable of communion with God and the angels. And the soul is the glory of creation. And the soul, your soul, according to Hebrews 3 verse 6, your soul is God's house that he has made to dwell in. The soul is spiritual. If you look in your Bible, in the Old Testament, the first book of your Bible, Genesis 2, then you see that God breathed the soul into man according to Genesis 2. Whilst the body is material, you've got the material body, and you've got senses like hearing and feeling and um, seeing, your soul is not material. Your soul is immaterial. And your soul do not die with the body. Does that make sense? Your life had a beginning, but it does not have an end. One day, you will die, and your body will be laid in the ground or will be burned at the crematorium. But your soul will last forever. And Jesus said in the Bible, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Your soul has an endless life. That's why it's so important. It's immortal. It cannot die. It has a beginning, but it has no end. I have a soul. It's inside me. I can't see it, but it lasts forever. Amen? And so does you. And when we as believers, and I'm just now talking about believers, I'm not talking about unbelievers, when we as believers die, our souls are with Jesus immediately, according to Philippians 1 verse 23. Now, many years ago, it was a tradition and a practice among the Romans that when an emperor died, his body was burnt in a funeral pyre and an eagle was released above his ashes to, to carry his soul to the heavens. That was many, many years ago. That was just a custom. Yeah? That was just a tradition. But I think the point is clear. My friend, the soul is not capable of being killed. It has a beginning, but no end. It is eternal. And according to Jesus Christ, the soul has a very, very high value. Why is your soul so valuable? Because God made it. And Jesus bought it. Jesus sold himself to buy the soul. According to Zechariah 11 verse 12, they paid 30 pieces of silver for Jesus. That was paid by Judas Iscariot. My friend, your soul cost the blood of Jesus, the creator of heaven and earth. That's how valuable your soul is. We read in 1 Peter 1 verse 19 that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, 
but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He paid for your soul. Jesus died so that your soul could live. The creator of heaven and earth was pawned for the soul of human beings. Jesus couldn't give something more valuable than that. He gave the most valuable thing he could give, and that is himself. My friend, your soul is worth much more than the world. The world is just a lump of clay. Go and read in the book of Genesis. The world is just a lump of clay. When God made the world, God said in Genesis, God said, let it be, and it was done. He just spoke it. He said, let it be, and it was done. But when he made the soul, all the persons in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sat together at a council table. And according to Genesis 1, verse 26, God said, come, let us make man in our image. That was God's word. So much of God is seen in your soul. And although it's cracked, broken by the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, it still resembles much of God. Amen? It still resembles much of God. You are more, much more, than animal life form. You bear the image of God in a way that no other living being or thing does. You bear the image of God in the fact that you are a moral, real, um, rational, and spiritual being. You're more than a biological being. You're much more than a clump of cells and a mass of molecules. You're not merely the product of electrical impulses and chemical reactions. Your soul has the image of God to doll you up and glamorize you, and the blood of Jesus to buy you back after the fall. Jesus was the priest. His divine nature was the altar, and his blood, the sacrifice, which he offered up as an atonement for your soul. And that's the price he paid for your soul. So just think how much a drop of Jesus' blood is worth. And then try and explain to me how much your soul is worth. And yes, Satan knows the value of your soul. He knows exactly the value of your soul. He knows what your soul is worth. And because of that, he uses various temptations to try and get your soul. He used wealth and power and pride and sex and lust and all sorts of things, whatever your weakness is to try and get your soul. Because your soul is worth so much. You see, my friend, God has given you souls that sparkle with divine beauty. So please, don't abuse your souls. Maybe you say, Luis, how do I abuse my soul? You do it, I, I, I got three points there for you. You abuse your souls by starving it, by strangling it, or by surrendering it. That's how you abuse your souls. First of all, you can starve your soul. Jesus said very clearly in the Bible that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, bread sustains your body. And the word of God sustains your soul. We all know 
that if we don't take in enough nutrients for our bodies, that we will eventually starve ourselves, isn't it? We'll starve ourselves. And my friend, it's the same for your soul. Without proper spiritual nourishment, your soul will just shrivel up. Your emotions will become dry and brittle. And your mind and eventually your body will weaken and go places and do things that you will live to regret one day. For instance, is that extra 30 minutes of sleep in the morning really worth the price you would pay for your soul? Is it really worth it to starve your soul? You answer that question. And then the next thing is you can strangle your soul. We read in Mark 4 verse 19 that the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word of God and it proves unfruitful. That's how you strangle your soul with all these things around you. Yes, you can be so busy living life with your relentless schedule and the multiple activities of your children, so busy running around, and the demands of your career, and cooking and cleaning and gymming, that the Bible is completely choked out of your life, strangled. And the Word of God has been choked and it is becoming unfruitful in your life because you are losing your soul because you are too busy. Your busyness is strangling the life out of your soul. That is the second thing. The third thing is you can surrender your soul. We read in 1 Peter 2 verse 11, we read, and he said, Beloved, and I read from the Bible here, Beloved, I urge you to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. So your passions kill your soul, or it has the possibility, the potential. God says that there are passions of the flesh and that those passions wants to destroy your soul. Our real battle is not with people, the people around us, but with the passions within us. That is our real battle. And when you are tempted with some passion and you give yourself to it, then you are surrendering your soul. Make sense? If you yield to sinful appetites, then we will start living like the unsaved around us, and we will become ineffective witnesses. You will become ineffective. And just remember one thing, that unsaved people that do not have the gospel of Jesus Christ are watching us, seeing whether we are hypocrites or walking our talk. Unsaved people are watching us, speaking against us and looking for reasons to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ that could save them. So we must not surrender our souls. There's so much at stake. Their salvation is at stake. So we must not surrender our souls. We must walk our talk, my friend. We must walk our talk. We need to live with integrity. We can't say one thing and do something different. The biggest problem in the world is people 
with empty souls, trying to fill their, soul, their, their souls with empty things, working their heads off every day, running around, trying to get the perfect body and good health, daily checking eBay for bargains, paying more and more for insurance for everything that is locked away, away in, in, in their safes. Now, all these things are not bad in itself. Don't get me wrong. It's not bad at all in itself. But it depends how you deal with these things. Amen? And the Bible gives criteria for how to deal with the stuff without forfeiting or losing your soul. And there's three questions that you need to ask yourself. The one has to do, and it's there, criteria for dealing with stuff. Durability, emotional value, and eternal value. So look at the first one, durability. Will the stuff that I spend my money and my time and my effort on, will it last? Is it durable? My friend, God has given us immortal souls. And these things that we spend our time and our money and our energy on, is it really durable? Is it going to last? Is it going to help you in eternity? If we spend our time and energy on, for instance, collecting classic cars, we are going to battle with rust, aren't we? Because they rust. If we spend it on loads of jewelry, someone might come and steal it, isn't it? If we spend it on loads of books, a flood can take it out. And yes, these things are amazingly attractive. It's very nice to have it. But really, they can't pass the test of durability. They are not eternal. My friend, you have an eternal soul. And therefore, it's good to invest in something that has eternal value. Amen. George Beverly Shear died in 2013 at the age of 104. And according to the Guinness Book of Records, he sang before more people than any other person in the whole world. But his most famous song had a very simple message. And the song is, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. And I think he was exactly right. Nothing is as important as your soul. Nothing is as important as the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And then it brings us to emotional value. Will the things that you spend your time, money, and energy on help you when you feel despondent, when you feel lonely, when you feel desperate? Will it really help you? Say, for instance, you spent a lot of time making money, and one day you feel a bit down in the dumps, and you cry out in loneliness or desperation. Can your money dry away your tears and comfort you? Can it? No, it can't. Does your iPad speak to you and encourage you when you feel down in the dumps? Does your beautiful dress talk back to you and love you? No, it can't. And yes, I know that, it, that sometimes it gives you loads of pleasure. But that is fleeting. It, these things can't laugh with you. It can't cry with you. It can't talk with you. And it won't help you in eternity either. And then it brings me to my last point, the eternal value. Will the stuff 
that you spent your time, money, and energy on, will those things save your soul? That's the question you need to ask. Will it save your soul? Because you see, you are not just the sum total of a body and a brain. You have a soul. And so Jesus insists that we ask this question. Imagine, just come with me and imagine your wonderful place in Kensington. All the artworks in your house. What an amazing collection. And your friends are raving about it. It's really good. And you've got the world's greatest diamonds. Big diamonds. Perfect. And you've got a fantastic holiday home. And you've got a wonderful snazzy car. And you've got it all. But you've lost your soul. What would you give in exchange for your soul? Do you see? You've got all the material things, but you've got a lost soul. Or a strangled soul. Or a starved soul. So what does it profit you? Can you take all this stuff and say to God one day at the judgment seat, God, just look at all my diamonds. Aren't they beautiful? This is amazing. Just look how it sparkles. They're flawless. Do you really think that God will be impressed by that? God already told you empty times in the Bible that the whole world is nothing in comparison to the worth of your soul. And our generation's drug, sex, and alcohol cravings just prove that we can't fill the God-shaped vacuum that exists in every heart with things of the world. Still empty. The poverty in the West is a different kind of poverty, my friend. We think we are rich, but we are poor. We've got a different poverty. It's a spiritual and emotional poverty that we have. And people are so deceived that they don't even know that they don't know. So far, I gave you three ways of losing your soul and three criteria to test whether you are dealing with stuff in the right way. But I'm very much aware that some of you are caring for your souls, and so I just want to touch on that as well. There are people in our church who have never read Shakespeare. They never saw the seven cities of the book of Revelation in Turkey. They never saw Jerusalem nor all Rome in all of its splendor and glory. But they know the word of God. They know something that some of our leaders in government doesn't know. They know things of eternal value that the majority of world leaders don't know. And the knowledge that they have, if they apply it in their lives, will be the greatest investment in all of eternity. They know how the world began and they know how it is going to end. They know that their sins have all been forgiven by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. They know who Jesus Christ is. They know that someone is more powerful than the grave. They know what happens after death. And they enjoy a face-to-face -face encounter with God on a daily basis. They've got a relationship with God. And such knowledge means that they have a new song in their mouths and a peace in their hearts. They have made a decision 
and they are not starving, strangling, or, or surrendering their souls, but they take care of their souls. And if this is you, I want to say that is fantastic. Keep on with that. My friend, if you lose material things, then you've not lost everything. You've not lost everything. You may lose your home in a fire, but that home can be rebuilt, okay? You may lose what you have in the stock market, but wealth can be re-earned or replaced given enough time and opportunity. We know that, isn't it? But if there is an eternity, and there is, and if we are created in the image of an eternal and transcendent God, and we are, and if we will stand before him in judgment after this life is over, and we will, believers and non-believers alike, and if we will spend eternity somewhere, either in his presence or in hell, and you can count on that, then, my friend, if you lose your soul, it means that you've lost everything. And that's the bottom line. And it's your choice. But if you lose your soul, it's irreparable. The loss can never be made up again. Are there any more saviors to, to die for the soul? No. Jesus Christ came once to die for the soul. Not going to come a second time to die for the soul. God will not send his son a second time to die for your soul. He already did it. Jesus Christ is going to come a second time, but not to save the world, but to judge the world. So my friends, remember you have but one soul. And if that is gone, all is gone. Chrysostom, one of the church fathers, he said, God has given you two eyes. If you lose one, you have another one. But you have but one soul. And if that perishes, then you are quite undone. You are quite undone. Once your soul is lost, it's lost forever. If you miss heaven and go to hell, what a fool you are. What a wasted life you have lived. Jesus comes back and he asks the question that the sermon is all about. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You can't. Death might come at any moment for all of us. How much is your soul worth? How sinful and foolish it is for anyone to neglect salvation or to put it off and say, I will deal with that tomorrow. This is the day that God is calling you. This is, you are sitting here. I am listening to my own, own sermon. I am also evaluating my own life. This is the day to come to Jesus today and be saved and be cleansed from your sin by the blood that he shed on that cross for your sin. He has risen from the dead, we know. He is up in heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. So entrust your soul in his care. Turn from sin and trust him. He will save you for all time and for all eternity. So please, I want to close and I want to say, 
Please live life in the light of eternity. Life without God is meaningless. Remember, at the end of your life, at the close of your life, the question will not be how much have you got, but how much have you given? Not how much have you won, but how much have you done? Not how much have you saved, but how much have you sacrificed? Not how much have you honored, but how much have you served? That will be the question. I want us to reflect on these words of Jesus, and we will listen to a video clip. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Let us come before the Lord. Father God, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we want to thank you for your word that is eternal. We want to say thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ, that he paid that price for our souls. Help us, Father, each one of us, as we go our own ways, that we reflect on these words of Jesus, and that we come to you, the eternal Father, that we come so that we could be forgiven, be restored, and partake in eternal life. And may the Lord our God be with you. May he bless you. May he give you his peace. May you be showered with his love. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.